my name is Irine Demogianese. I'm Dean of Academic Affairs at INSPER. And it's my pleasure and honor to open this uh, event. It's part of the European Union uh, Week. Uh, at INSPER is the second edition. We have a very uh, 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 exciting and, and productive discussions last year. And it's part of uh, the school uh, effort and, and journey uh, to internationalization. Uh, and it's uh, a major issue in the strategic uh, initiatives at INSPER. And also a major issue of uh, the recent uh, acquired international accreditation uh, INSPIR was uh, now in March accredited by the EQUIS, the European Quality Improvement System. Uh, and it's one of the three uh, most important international accreditations, so the school is now uh, triple crown, as we say. Uh, and this year we have uh, at INSPIR two events, uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, and it's part of a, uh, of a whole uh, week, uh, and I'll let my colleague, my partner in this initiative, uh, the Consul of Luxembourg, uh, uh, Jan, to give more uh, details. And uh, I would like to uh, welcome uh, you here, and I bet we'll have a very exciting and instigating uh, debate. Jan, please. Dear, dear colleagues, dear uh, Irineu, thank you very much for making this uh, second part of, of our European week. And I'd like to welcome everyone. Let me ask you a question to everyone. Who in the audience is descendant of Europe who continue this? And I'd like to, before I talk about the week, uh, so they can sit, uh, thank Fernando Schuller, Known of you who will be our moderator, I'd like to welcome to Sao Paulo our ambassador of the Netherlands, Han Peters. I'd like to welcome Zilat from Consul General of Hungary. I'd like to welcome Paulo Lorenzo, who was also participating in Consul General of Portugal. I'd like to welcome Charles Delon, Consul General of Belgium. And last but not least, uh, Michel Pala, Consul General of Italy. Uh, the idea of the European Week is, is actually the date where we celebrate the European Week is May 9th. And as we have ambassadors uh, in t also in during this week, they have to be in Brazil uh, on May 9th. So we have, in, we have started a bit earlier. Let me talk to you briefly on the program. So today and tomorrow, uh, we'll have the event at, at INSPIR. Tomorrow, today, we will have more social aspects, geopolitical aspects of a debate. Uh, I ask you to really have participate. There will be a microphone around, and, or, and whoever doesn't want to expose themselves, want to write uh, a letter, somebody will, uh, or a paper, somebody will pick up your paper. Uh, so to, and tomorrow will be economical area. On Wednesday and Thursday, we'll have uh, 9 o'clock, and everybody's invited at USPI. Uh, together with the Cathedra of Jean Monnet, which is a, uh, an institution of the European Union who collaborates with several universities in Brazil. So then on Friday, we'll have uh, an event uh, at Fiespi, who you also think uh, the, the whole invitation is also in the, in, on, in the right. So we'll have on, on Fiespi, we'll have uh, with, the, with the presence of the foreign minister of Brazil, the presence of the European ambassador, Jean Cravinho, where we will discuss the two main topics, where we will discuss the agreement between uh, the European Union and Mercosur, get up the update and looking how, how things are, because after all, this has been negotiated for the last 20 years. So we hopefully we go further this year. And then the second part will be uh, technology, innovation, and investment. So, and on Sunday, on Sunday at four o'clock at the Sala São Paulo, we are. Uh, 
finalizing our European week with, uh, with uh, Orchestra Jovem, which is a very nice social project which started in the favelas with the Projeto Guri. You should look it up in the net. Whoever, uh, we're also still looking for sponsors because we are donating this money to, uh, to, uh, to the orchestra, which is a social project, as I said, conducted by, uh, by a Polish uh, conductor with, uh, with Polish composition. Uh, I'd also like to welcome my colleagues here who are present here, Consul General of Holland, Cor van Hoek, Sharon from Ireland, Axel Zeitler from Germany, Cesar Aguiar from Cyprus, uh, and several other colleagues who are also present during this week. So thank you very much, and I hope you uh, enjoy the, the day. I just finishing, I, I forgot to tell you, the reason being we want to talk about Europe in, in, in these times of today, uh, where we going into a lot of, and this will be the debate of discussions here, is the European values. I think that's what Europe stands for, and that's what Europe is known for, and that's, I have, we have a small slide which you can't look, but I think the important thing which we want to convey today are not only what's happening in Europe in the future, but I think I'd like to point out, and I think in our days, is the European values. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a great honor to have you here. T tonight we have a more political debate about the future, around the future of the European Union, about cultural aspects, about migration, about xenophobia, about the Brexit, about the election in France recently, about uh, some issues that we are very curious to, to analyze. I suggest 10 minutes for an opening speech and after we can open to questions from our public, okay? Can we start from the right to left? General Consul uh, Charles DeLong, could you open for 10 minutes? Then after we go from, from right to left, okay? Do you? Yeah, you hear me. Boa noite a todos. Good evening to everybody. I'm very happy and pleased to be here with you uh, to start this uh, European Week uh, in Sao Paulo. Uh, I haven't prepared a long speech, in fact, for, for, uh, about Europe, uh, just uh, to remind some basic things. Uh, in 1945, the, the European continent was devastated by the Second World War. The Second War, uh, World War in uh, in the century, uh, the, the 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 cities were destroyed. Uh, there were food shortages, and uh, many uh, uh, governments had huge debts that complicated uh, the the the, the uh, reconstruction. Uh, so uh, the, the the first multilateral initiative was Benelux. Uh, in fact, the, true, the, the, the three Benelux countries understood that uh, new neutrality policies had failed and uh, in order to assure the national security, the best option was to uh, foster uh, and to encourage uh, our big and powerful neighbors to, uh, to cooperate uh, and, to, 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 and even to integrate. Uh, I think uh, the, 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 the most important added value of Europe is peace. When you look at the history of, uh, of the European continent, uh, it's a, a long series of uh, conflicts, and, uh, and in fact, the, 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 the highest added value of Europe is to have preserved peace for uh, no uh, more than 70 years. Uh, we can reflect uh, about the future of uh, Europe, what do we, we need. In fact, I think that uh, our vision about what Europe uh, needs to be was perfectly well formulated uh, when we prepare uh, the, the, the biggest uh, EU enlargement in the 90s. I think uh, the, the Copenhagen criteria uh, set the, the values we are attached to, uh, democracy, rule of law, uh, um, a, market, uh, a market economy uh, with social policies. Uh, I think uh, all this uh, showed uh, what uh, we expect from our new uh, uh, member states. Uh, now uh, we have discussions about the future of Europe uh, with the Brexit. It's true that uh, nowadays uh, Europe is confronted with a lot of challenges. 
uh, and uh, maybe uh, the future is in uh, Europe more uh, focalized on uh, on some uh, specific competences instead of having initiatives in all uh, spheres of uh, of policies, but uh, in fact, we also have to admit that if uh, the European Union is active in all uh, fields of uh, policies, uh, it's because it had an it has an added value. Uh, if we legislate on environment, it is because it is impossible uh, for individual state to prevent pollution from crossing borders. Uh, we have a lot of challenges uh, we uh, tackle better if we do that together. Uh, we can think about uh, the inst institutional issues. Uh, in fact, uh, we have the possibility to have strengthened corporations. Uh, my government uh, uh, is in favor of strengthened corporations uh, since now uh, almost 20 years, I think. Uh, Euro is maybe the best example. But of course, uh, it's always better to work together and uh, to reach our objectives together. That's what I wanted to say. I won't uh, be too long because uh, I know that uh, my other colleagues also have important things to say. Thank you. Muito boa noite a todos. I was forced to speak English because apparently I had trouble with the local language. So. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank INSPER, my, my colleagues, uh, all, all of you who have decided to give a bit of your time to this debate. Uh, I, I represent a country which I think is a good example of how uh, far-reaching uh, the impact of the European Union was. Uh, you cannot understand Portugal today, what it is, the evolution it has undercurred, without understanding the impact of Europe, uh, of, of Europe since we have joined uh, the European Union. Uh, I think we are living uh, an interesting time. I think Europe is under psychoanalysis today. Uh, there's a lot of European Union bashing. Um, there's a lot of, it's, it's, it's almost like it has become intellectually, uh, intellectually uh, sexy to uh, bash the European Union, uh, like uh, you could find there all the troubles in the world. And I, I think it is, we should be fair to the European Union project and to try to understand how much it has achieved, not only in terms of peace, but in terms of prosperity, in terms of stability, and the sheer fact that while with all these problems, you still have a queue of countries wanting to join the European Union. Um, I also would like to, to share, just to, uh, as, as a sort of an insight, because I would very much prefer to, to discuss this in Q&A uh, after this, which is that in a way, um, we find in the territory of the European Union a sort of uh, localization of this bigger debate about the challenges put forward by globalization. These, uh, um, these, these challenges, these tensions created by globalization, by the fact that we have globalized in a way, but we have, uh, we have globalized without solving a lot of bad history behind us. Uh, you, you, you could have a very developed uh, economic bloc in the European Union, but you still have problems with your neighbors. You still have problems in the stability of your neighbors who are not so far away from you. So uh, the fact that we have these migration challenges, the fact that we have a xenophobic uprise, and we'll, uh, we'll like to speak about that uh, a little longer after this, uh, the fact that you have this extremi extremist rise, the fact that you have this uh, populist trend uh, rising up, I would still argue that it is far greater what the European Union has achieved. And the fact that in a way, the European Union, because of its social model, and because that itself it is a, a, a European, it, it is a model, it is a group that has also had to face the challenges put by, by globalization, that in fact, these issues we've been discussing, 
these tensions we'll be discussing, they acquire a far greater critical aspect than if you were discussing the issues worldwide. So in a way, by uh, the, the challenge of facing the European Union could be a sort of a case to discuss other issues that we have to deal with globally, globally speaking. So I, I, I would for now, leave it at that because I would very much prefer to discuss it with you afterwards. Thank you very much. Boa noite a todos. Sou Silar Trek, Consul General da Hungria. I am Consul General of Hungary. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much for your invitation, and I'm very happy to be able to participate in this event. I think uh, it's a very appropriate day today because just yesterday was uh, 13 years ago when Hungary entered or for admitted to the European Union. Okay, uh, I know that uh, the number 13 not a very lucky number, but for us, I think for Hungary it was a, uh, a very lucky lucky number. 13 years in the in the European Union. Um, what I wanted to say that uh, Hungary now uh, is an integrated part of the European Union. Um, but maybe in the in the press, in the foreign press, you can observe that there are a lot of uh, uh, debates, maybe debates on Hungary's role in the in the European Union, uh, especially in the questions of migration and and and, and uh, these uh, topics related to to migration. I I think there will be a lot of questions on that topic also uh, this night uh, tonight. Uh, I will be very happy to, to answer them. Uh, and I know that there, maybe there will be some disagreement for my counterparts, for my colleagues, but nothing personal, of course. Uh, <laughs> we are all friends and Europeans here, but it uh, also, uh, I think, it's a big characteristic of the Hungarian and the European uh, peoples that we can uh, uh, speak and discuss uh, topics uh, politically. Uh, peacefully, and that's why I think um, uh, Hungary also, also demonstrated this uh, this intention. Uh, what I just wanted to say only a few words about the history of Hungary, uh, because Hungary always was uh, on the divide uh, between East and, and and the West of Europe, and uh, it, it was like a fairy country. Which sometimes uh, belong to the to the east, and sometimes, and nowadays, it belongs to the west. And uh, uh, maybe you you can read some articles uh, opposite of that that Hungary belongs to the west. But I can assure that Hungary, Hungarian government, and and the uh, overwhelming majority of the Hungarian people is is pro Europe, and uh, more or less seventy percent of the Hungarian population has uh, feelings pro Europeans. European feelings. And uh, when you read some articles about migration crisis affecting Hungary, I just want to say that Hungary always was at the front line. Uh, not because hung Hungarians are a very uh, fighting nation or something like that, we, we like fighting or something like that, but it was historical facts. And nowadays, Hungary also uh, are at the borders, at the external borders of European Union. And that's why we are facing real challenges of migration. And that's why maybe uh, our position or attitude a little bit different than of the most uh, members of the European uh, community, or European Union. Okay, uh, I think it's migration is enough for the introduction. But I hope we will have a very fierce uh, debate today. And on just a torcida organizada da Hungria. Obrigado. I need your help. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Han. I'm the Dutch ambassador to uh, Brazil. Han is the uh, way how Dutch people uh, say João. And so. Um, and thank you, it's great to be with you because it's always good for a guy living in Brasilia to have an excuse to go to a real city like Sao Paulo. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's always good. Um, I was born five weeks after the signing of the Treaty of Rome. So, those who are good at math, they can figure out sort of what my age is. And I was born in a little city about 20 kilometers from the German border. 
And I remember when I was young that we would take our bikes with a couple of friends and we would go to Germany. At that time, there were still border posts. You need to have a passport and all that kind of thing. But sort of we liked to have a little bit of adventure. So we went there biking, choosing by roads, of course, not taking our passports, of course, that would uh, have less excitement. And so there we were in an hour and 15 minutes, we were in another country. Um, so I was, I was born uh, Dutch, but um, I very, very much was raised a European. And if you look at the image of Europe nowadays, well, you may want to commit suicide, you know? Brexit, immigration, uh, populist parties, uh, you name it. But I think despite all of this, the real value of Europe is much more. And I think Europe is much stronger than it currently is being described in the press. Um, when I was preparing for this evening, I came across an article written by Andrew Moravchik, who is a professor of European studies at Princeton University. Uh, it was published three weeks ago in Foreign Policy. And he called Europe the invisible superpower. The invisible superpower. And I very much agree with him. Because if you look at power, you can divide into between soft and hard power. Normally, Europe is being seen as a, a soft power, but soft power is very important. If you look at the welfare state, which is basically developed in Europe, I think it still is a big, big achievement. Uh, trying to have a social system that will support uh, also the people who have less skills, less, less possibilities to develop, to provide a safety net for all. I think that's Europe. That's something that says something about solidarity. Of course, culture, language. Once we mention these, these things, uh, it's clear that Europe has a big contribution made to world civilization, and I think it's going to, to do that as well in the future. But then, let's talk a bit about hard power. OK, who are the, the, the champions of hard power in the world? The United States. Uh, about 10 years ago, Robert Kagan, an American uh, um, uh, uh, publicist, he wrote a book which is called Of Paradise and Power. And he said something like, you know, United States are from Mars and Europe is from Venus. You know, this museum, which is nice to visit, but they don't have real power. Well, if you look at the facts, it might be a bit different. Okay, it's, it's true that if you look at spending on defense in the world, the United States spent about 30%. But then Europe comes second, 15 to 70%. China, 10%. Russia, 7 So uh, the EU, uh, Europe, spends as much as the China and Russia together. If you look at economics, uh, the nominal GDP of, of Europe is as big as that of the United States, and it's 40% bigger than that of China. If Europe is all over the world the biggest investor, it's the biggest uh, uh, trader in the world. Um, so there's also in the sphere of hard power a lot going for it. But what I think is the most attractive thing and also the base for, for our future is our diversity. There's something about European values. But I think the great thing in Europe is diversity. Um, I mentioned my trip to, many trips to, to, uh, to Germany uh, by bike. And once you cross the border, it's really fascinating. It's a different country, different houses, different way of living, different, uh, uh, different type of food. But on the other hand, we all share the same vision, the same dreams, the same ideals. And I think that's the power of Europe. And if you look at the big challenges that we face in this world, it's going to be the energy uh, transition. We have to get rid of uh, fossil energy. We have to find new ways of, of supporting this world. Look at robotization. Um, I think the, uh, what, what, what Trump has said, it's not about wages anymore, the future. It's about robotization. And the big challenge for us is how do we provide um, uh, jobs for people that are not able to... Um, to work in the future. And I think Europe is very, very well prepared for this, what I call the age of diversity. I think diversity is a power and not something which is weak. And the big challenge for us now in Europe is indeed to try to preserve that diversity, to try to convince the populace and others that 
you know, closing doors is bad. Opening doors, opening your mind, opening your spirit, that's a good thing. And that's why I have faith in Europe. Thank you. So first of all, thank you very much to INSPER. It's really great. I, I've participated in the debate last year here, and uh, I must say that to see the whole room full is, is really uh, very exciting. I'm very happy to have uh, this audience here today. So thanks to INSPER, thanks to those who have organized this event today. And uh, when, you, when, you, when you are the last one to make the introduction, it's quite easy because most of the things uh, have already been said, so really I, I can subscribe to what my colleague said in giving this first picture of, uh, of Europe and, and why we are here. But let, let me just add a few, a few concepts. So why, why are we here? <clears throat> a group of us, uh, of consul generals with the, the support of embassies, obviously, we always thought that uh, the, the image of the European Union in Brazil, and especially here in Sao Paulo where we're working, is not exactly what, what it should be. We are not known enough. People and even the media do not know uh, well enough the European Union. So uh, that's why altogether we, uh, we wanted to have uh, occasions like this ones to, to be open, to, uh, to tell a little bit also stories which are not on the newspapers. Because unfortunately, when you read, read the newspapers, what, uh, what, what the news are are usually not very positive stories about the European Union. I mean, you hear about the Brexit, you hear about some issues we have on migration, on, uh, on financial crises of some of our countries and so on. And so what we do uh, give the image is sometimes to tend to forget what in fact the European Union is and where we come from. And Charles, who, Charles uh, our Belgian colleague who made the introduction, he. You remembered it. So it costed us two world wars to have something that no one else in the world you have. We have the greatest integration of countries in the world. We are a big group, but we are so integrated from a, a political, from a, from a commercial, from a social point of view, like any other place in the world. And this is something we cannot forget. The fact that uh, our students, our ch our students can go and have with Erasmus, which is a, is a great program, they can study for a semester or for a period in one part of, of Europe and then come back to their own country, or that we can trade from one country from to the other, that we don't have any barriers, any any borders. That is something which I think is so great that we always have to keep in mind when we discuss where we are today, especially now that we are 60 years. The, on the 25th 25 of the March, we had the, uh, the anniversary of the Treaties of Rome, which the ambassador uh, remembered now, which was, let's say, the founding uh, uh, treaty of the European Union of six countries. Uh, some of them are represented here today, and the others joined later on. So this is uh, an important moment to remember what we achieved together and not to forget it when it seems like, I think uh, Paolo uh, put it very well, that somewhere in the debate, in the internal debate, uh, there has to be, to, a sort of scapegoat has to be found. Someone has to be found guilty for the difficulties the population is facing. And, and it is important that we, that we do the debate in the right way and that we say all the story, not just the one part which can be uh, the one which goes into the, into the rhetoric of, of some uh, uh, un, uh, Eurosceptics, if we, want to, if we call, you know, want to call them like that, which, which is a legitimate uh, position. I don't, I'm not saying that it is not. One can have his uh, Euroscepticism, but one has to take into account the whole story. I just would like to say this. When uh, I was uh, uh, in, in, uh, at the end of my school years, uh, Europe was still divided by the Iron Wall. So we had Eastern Europe, which was still in the Soviet uh, area. And it was for us literally unthinkable, at least for me, that this would end one day. 
So the fact that I'm sitting here today together with my Hungarian colleague and that we have other countries from the Eastern Europe who are together of this, united with us in this big family, I think it's something so great that we cannot go back. The future is not to have, uh, I think, uh, a union, uh, uh, a, a, a loser union, but a closer union. Because, I don't remember, Charles put it like this, there are lots of things that we will be able to do better together, not alone. Alone, most of our countries wouldn't be able to have big success on the, on the world scene. From a political point of view, from an economical point of view, and even from a social point of view. Because the important things are the values. Because what unites us is not, it's freedom, it's peace, the 60 years of peace, and even more if we count from the end of the Second World War, and the values that, of democracy that are at the base of our union. If I think, and with this I will close because, in fact, I've, what would be interesting is to hear a little bit what, what goes in the minds of people who uh, probably uh, are here to know a little bit more about the European Union is something which is interesting. I, am, <clears throat> I have children. Um, because of my job, I've been living abroad for a long time, so my children are used to live in foreign countries. And when we travel from these foreign countries, we are used to cross borders. So when I was in the US, I had to cross the border to Canada with controls, with passports and things uh, in other countries as well. Last year we had to, we, we were in Foz du Iguazu and we said, okay, let's go and have a look to the Argentinian side. One hour and a half in the line to have the uh, passport control at the, at the Argentinian checkpoint. So when we go to Europe, my children are just fascinated by the fact that last year we were driving from Germany, from Munich, to, to Milan. And uh, at a certain point I said, pay attention, pay attention, because we are entering into Austria. But we won't stop, just there will be a little sign that says we are now going to into Austria. And one hour later, not even one hour later, I said again, pay attention, now we are entering into Italy. No borders, no borders from any point of view. This is an integration which is so great that I think we should never forget and which could serve also as an example. I don't want to be paternalistic, but this is a model of integration which can serve also for other parts of the world to look at the European Union from what we have achieved, even if we have many challenges in front of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's amazing, of course. Uh, Mercosur is a shame, okay? It's a shame. It's a shame. But uh, just a question, one question. I will open for the public. Prepare your, your question, please. But just to, to be more precise about the source of criticism on the European Union nowadays, the source of nationalism. There is the migration problem, is the crisis of the welfare state in Europe, is the kind of... Uh, the bureaucracy of Brussels, uh, we can say that, uh, which is the source of nationalism, with the source of this criticism? In fact, we have Marie Le Pen in France trying to escape from the European Union. In fact, we have Brexit, which is, this, uh, we know Erasmus, we, we know this common tradition, this common culture, we know this is, the, 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 it, this is an amazing construction of our democracy, I, I would say of our civilization that is Europe, but we have a problem of identity nowadays. I know this book of Fick and Kral, for instance. We are living in a kind of shock of civilization, we can say, or we, we cannot say something like Huntington has proposed it, uh, 25 years ago. So which is the source of this problem of nationalism and this criticism? on the European Union nowadays. Hello, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. For me, the, the biggest source of this is people feeling insecure. People, um, and that's may mainly, I think, because of globalization, of things, whatever you think of globalization, it's something which is sort of, it's happening because, you know, the world of internet is connecting anyone and, and robotization is going to happen. What do we see? 
people who are afraid of losing their jobs, afraid of losing their way of life. Look at who voted for Brexit in the, in the, um, in the UK. Uh, older people, lesser educated, people who are, and that's a real problem that we as European Union, as we as member states have to try to solve, people who don't have a real future. So they are afraid. So what's happening? They will find a scapegoat and they will think that nationalist solutions are going to help them, which they are not going to help. Uh, so this is this basically which, if you look at look at uh, uh, the ones in the Netherlands who vote for populist party, you look at the ones who uh, support uh, Le Pen, look at the ones who voted for Trump. It's all the same uncertainty, the feeling of insecurity, people afraid of losing what they have. And that's, I think, what is the cause of the problem. Well, the question was, uh, what is the source of uh, Euroscepticism? Uh, I agree with my uh, Dutch colleague that uh, the fears in the populations are important, especially now in a society where uh, information uh, circulates so, so quickly and so easily. Uh, but let me emphasize one uh, important institutional aspect in the European Union. You have a bicephal uh, executive power in the European Union. You have the Commission, it's an independent body, with one uh, commissioner uh, uh, coming from each uh, member state. And uh, the Commission has uh, the monopoly of the legislative initiative. Everything, everything in the decision-making process that, fin that finally comes out uh, is the outcome of uh, an initiative of the European Commission. But it's just the beginning of the process. Then you have a debate within the other uh, face of, uh, of the executive power, which is the Council of Ministers. There, uh, the, 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 the legislative proposals uh, coming from the European Commission are discussed and then uh, adopted, modified, at a qualified uh, majority or sometimes uh, by unanimity. This is the model uh, of decision-making uh, uh, mechanism. In fact, when Brussels decides something, uh, it is a common decision. And it happened too often in the past that uh, political leaders who adopted decisions in Brussels are not solidar with their own decision. And once they are back in their capital, they begin to uh, criticize the decisions of Brussels. This is completely unfair, but unfor unfortunately, this is something we have been observing for years in many mer member states. Uh, and of course, it undermines the credibility of the decisions taken by the European Union. Uh, and no matter if those decisions finally improve the daily life of all European citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I think the key word is the credibility. Uh, I also agree. Uh, when uh, the European Union is facing a lot of problems, uh, the average people is uh, is lost, of course, and, and uh, asking why the European Union cannot uh, uh, solve these problems. But there are a lot of, um, lot of problems to solve. And also, uh, the problem is that uh, there are two ways of approaching. Uh, for instance, for the countries who came from the Eastern or Socialist or Soviet bloc, you can call it as you wish, uh, they also always wanted to, to achieve a welfare state of the Western countries. But uh, I think, uh, with the exception of, of, of you, we couldn't achieve these uh, high levels of, of, of uh, welfare society. And uh, Western countries nowadays facing big problems of this welfare state. There are very high unemployment rate of, of, uh, uh, among the, the, the young people. and. Uh, when all these uh, everyday problems occur, the persons uh, or the, the citizens of Europe, we can say, we can call them that, uh, they are lost and, and they uh, lost the credibility or they uh, think that the Brussels or, Brussels or, or, or the European Union uh, doesn't make anything. Just uh, a lot of discussions, 
a lot of meetings, a lot of uh, uh, interesting proposals, but what is lacking is, is, is a common decision which is coming too late, maybe. And uh, nowadays we need fast responses, quick responses, and not uh, uh, long time uh, this, uh, long time decisions, of course, but which uh, doesn't take long time to to be made. And uh, maybe maybe it's also a problem. And this is the source of the criticism. And, and maybe that is the source of the nationalism, because if uh, the supranational power of Brussels or, or the European Commission cannot decide, cannot uh, uh, solve the problems, maybe our own government can do that. And uh, in some countries where there are some internal uh, problems also, uh, the electorate, electorate uh, the, the peoples with the right of uh, vote, they can choose who is the right, or government or, 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 or uh, European Union in Brussels. Maybe. Thanks. Let me... Uh just be, uh, let me have a crack on this. Um, uh, I think that one of the consequences of globalization is that we have globalized, uh, in the essence, our worries. I mean, I don't think that the wor worry of a common European citizen is so different from uh, the one of an American in the Midwest feels. There is a difference of circumstances, but in a way, if we're talking about the West, we're talking about mostly the same sort of worries been properly described described by the by the Dutch ambassador has fear has insecurity the fear of being left out the thing in europe is that europe is a construction the european union is a, an amazing conceptual construction uh, which in europe we have decided uh, uh, for the last years to make our our model of political organization. This meant, this meant that we had to concede some of our prerogatives, that we had to uh, concede some of our sovereignty, and that this decision was taken uh, based on the fact that according to our will and to our needs, we thought that this would make us stronger. This would make the components of this, of this uh, organization stronger. We are not talking about recent nations. We are talking about old nations. Old nations carry them with a lot, uh, a big bag of history. So it is all the, m all the more extraordinary that countries with such a long history, such a long and proud history, uh, such as the countries that compose the European Union, have decided, like they did, to do this, to organize themselves in this manner. Now, this has meant that when we are dealing with uh, everyday problems, with the problems that these citizens have, the fear, the insecurity, the social exclusion, the fear of being left, the fear of being left out because of, for the globalization, that we are not only deciding this on a national basis, we are deciding this on the basis of a decision-making process which is as Charles was saying, relatively complex. And again, uh, national politicians sometimes need to use the European Union as a scapegoat for their problems. Uh, so, uh, but again, it's not a European Union problem. It is an, an, an overall problem of everyone today in the West and in, in general. The, the thing is that the European Union, the, so, the way we are organized, it makes the decision-making process to solve these problems more difficult. Also, it enhances our tools, obviously, but before you get that, it takes a bit of time. I, I also wanted to say that, uh, because I think this has been mentioned, that w the problems that we are facing today, that the European Union facing today, we, it has been referred here before, nationalism, um, the uh, populist drive and all of that, they are not really new problems. Uh, and, and I think that in the next few months, this is my feeling, as you have these signs of economic recovery, like you are having now, 
uh, once the economy is once on track again on, on track that you will um, feel you will see these problems um, not dissolving because they will not dissolve but they will be put in perspective and they will become more easy to settle than before also may I also uh, just make a, a, a sort of a a, faith, a leap of faith uh, on this, which is to say that I think that this is the right moment for the European Union to reassert itself. And it is, is, if anything has the, the issue of the European Union proved, the issue of the European integration has proved, is that, that the European Union managed to be stronger exactly when it was facing her most difficult challenges. And this is exactly what I believe will happen in the next few years. Just, just to finish, since uh, very briefly, I, <coughs> you said nationalism. I am not so sure that this is true in all the European countries. I mean, we have some countries where it is obvious that there is a national nationalist tendency against uh, the European Union. But in other countries, um, for example, in Italy, this is, this is not the case. Um, we think uh, we have to distinguish when you have the critics against the euro. And so you have people debating uh, about the euro, which is in Italy now very one of the debates of the so-called Eurosceptics, and people who tend to think and want the people to think that all our problems, um, our economic problems, are because we are part of uh, uh, a monetary union and we are not able to devaluate our uh, our um, our currency in order to have uh, an advantage after the devaluation and have a, a, a boom in the exports and so on. So this is one of the aspects, because in Italy, uh, definitely, you cannot say that uh, the, the biggest uh, move, political movements which are against, um, not so much the European Union, but the Euro, are nationalist movements. We have the so-called five-star movement, which is definitely not a nationalist movement. We have uh, uh, the uh, so-called Northern League, which uh, its origin is not nationalist, but it's independentist. So um, it is quite different what, what the scenario we have uh, in, in, in the various countries uh, of Europe. But still, the problem is this cannot be underestimated. So for our leaders, uh, this is the moment to, uh, because you have to listen to this, uh, uh, to this um, Euroscepticism, because it means that still there is something which we have to do better. So it is the moment where the challenge is very at its highest because as Paolo said, this is the occasion to come out stronger than before, not weaker. There is no alternative from this point of view. So uh, we will need to see if we will be at the, uh, at the level of this challenge. Okay, thank you very much. So we will open for questions. Uh, we are open for three questions. Can uh, three questions? I will ask you to take notes and answer these three, and after we can make another another group of questions. Okay, let's your your name, please. Say your name and can. I, I will ask you to make short questions. Okay, short questions. Hi, my name is Raquel. Um, are you listening? Okay, now. So, my name is Raquel. Um, speaking of fear and nationalism, um, we are seeing a huge growth in terrorist attacks, lots of them in Europe. I'd like to know, well, for example, Trump blames it on the Muslims. People are blaming it on whoever it is. What does Europe, if Europe has a plan against it, like, what is there a, a whole plan for the European Union, or each of these con or of your countries have a say on it, or what is going to happen? Like people are fearful of this. So, uh, if there's any plan, if there's any say, a common say about this. Thank you. Another question. We have one here, please. Oh. Hi. Uh, my name is Rafael. I'm still getting uh, 
the light on her question, and you were saying, talking about a lot the uh, people feeling insecure and what to do against nationalism, as she said. But why does the EU have this uh, antagonist behavior, like up front? You were mostly imply that uh, people are acting the way they are because they are insecure and using the EU as a scapegoat. Is it really the case, or sh as uh, Mr. Paula said, uh, sh are there valid concerns in there that should, should demand a different approach from the EU, different response? After all, Brexit has happened. Okay, thank you. We have another. Hello. Oh, okay. Um, my name is João. Um, there are a lot of <coughs> concern about um, populism, uh, populism in the world now, and, and it's not um, um, about little countries, but it's the United States and France and and <coughs> and powerful countries like this. And there are a, a, a lot of concerns on medias and and the news and things like this about this. I'd like to know if we are not underestimating the popular decision of the people who voted for this position uh, put in the light to, to be picked. Uh, to be chosen uh, in these countries, because you know, um, no, that's my question. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have can can you start answer? It's we have space for more, one more question. Or no? Okay, that's that's answer. Can answer about terrorism. Uh, in fact, uh, Europe is confronted with, with terrorism for decades now. Uh, there have been uh, a lot of uh, terrorist attacks in Spain, uh, in Ireland, in Germany, in Italy, and also in Belgium. Uh, so, uh, already in 2001, uh, when Belgium was uh, chairing the European Union, uh, terrorist attacks occurred. Well, in fact, it was uh, uh, the 9 11 uh, attack. And uh, the European Union managed to have a common definition of terrorism. And uh, based on that, you can develop the, dev the, the, legisl the legislative framework to uh, fight terrorism. Uh, uh, but in fact, we, we, we have to stay realistic uh, and also to admit the consequences of our own acts. Uh, Brussels is the capital of the European Union and also the headquarter of, the, uh, of NATO. So when the United States were attacked by, uh, by Al-Qaeda, uh, we found it natural, we Belgium, uh, to support our American uh, allied and also to send troops to Afghanistan to combat the Taliban. So it means, it means that if we uh, uh, take our part in the, the burden sharing, uh, of uh, the, the, the fight against terrorism, we also have to accept the risks. Uh, and uh, once uh, you are confronted with terrorist attacks, of course you have to, to develop uh, the cooperation with the neighboring countries in order to, uh, to be more efficient in, in your fight. Um, you know that there, there were attacks uh, last, uh, last year in Belgium, uh, also in France, and in fact, we saw that uh, the terrorists in, uh, who made uh, attacks in France uh, were, were based in Belgium. So we increased quite a lot uh, our, uh, our, our cooperation with France. Uh, but it's difficult to arrive to a European system where we could uh, exchange classified and uh, sensitive information in full confidence. Uh, you know, fighting terrorism is complicated. Uh, um, and. Uh, and you also have a lot of information to treat. Uh, in the case of Belgium, uh, after the, w w we are maybe one, if I may say so, uh, the biggest uh, contributors per capita uh, to, uh, of uh, combatants in Syria. So those people uh, who come back, they have to be uh, closely followed up. Uh, and uh, so it means that our uh, intelligence uh, officers have to treat maybe 10 times more information just to uh, prevent any new uh, terrorist attack. So uh, it's a long work. Uh, zero risk does not exist. 
uh, it's a long, uh, it's an old story, uh, and uh, we also have to live with that. Um, could I just have to try to answer your question, uh, if I understood it correctly? I, I, I didn't want to sound overconfident or condescending uh, when I tried to make a bit of a, uh, forecasts. The, but the, the question that you raise is, I think, a fundamental question of our time, which is what happened uh, in, in the United States with the victory of, of Trump, what happened in the UK with, with Brexit, or in a way also this uh, populist drive that you can find here or there in the European Union, you cannot uh, you cannot uh, ignore, you cannot pretend that this does not, it is not happening. I think that we have, uh, particularly when I was watching or following the electoral campaign in the US, the feeling that I had was that uh, you, you were hearing all these things in Fox News about Trump and the, U the liberal media was, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> crucificating this, uh, uh, Fox News because they were biased and all of that and that they didn't they couldn't see the truth and the fact that it is that th there was this uh, there was this condescendence there is this condescendence that in, in in a way globalization is the same for everyone and it is not the same for everyone that in a way this is a very well-known expression that you have at least two speeds uh, that you have a, a different geometry um, people in different stages of that globalization. So in a way, what I felt happened, particularly in, in, in the US and in, in the UK, I think it's, in a way, they derive from the same sort of problems, where there's this discrepancy between the feeling that, you know, most of us have people who are in tune with our, what is happening, people who travel, uh, that this idea that we have of the world defines the overall majority of people living in the US or living in European Union according to this sort of uh, uh, civil, this civilization we're living in. And that is not the case. So I think that the fact that I am confident about the European Union does not ignore the fact that I, have to, I think that we have to be very, very serious and very, very demanding and not so self-indulgent about coping with these issues. There is a fundamental discrepancy here. As there is a fundamental discrepancy today when we talk about public policies and government, that we, our rulers, people who we uh, decide that to govern us, they have to respond to dif two different sorts of people. They have to uh, respond to their electors, people who elected them, but they also have to respond to their creditors. Because some of these countries, they, has, they also ha are influenced by the market. This is, this is particularly uh, clear today in the European Union, where um, governors, uh, go governments, they have to pay attention to, to both things. And this creates a tension that is very, very difficult to, 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 uh, to solve in, in, in the decision-making process. But moreover, if you have all the layers of governments, such as the ones you have in the European Union. So I think that is one of the fundamental questions of our time. We have been uh, condescending. Uh, we, we think that this is uh, Trump won, this was an anomaly. I, I, I don't think it is an anomaly. I think you have to understand sociologically what happened, and I think that the problem is not going to go away. Um, this liberal uh, view we have uh, from, from, from globalization is something that needs to be questioned all the time. And I think that, like uh, Mich Michele was saying, this is the time for our leaders to rise up to the occasion. This is a fundamental time for strong leaderships, uh, leaderships that can cope with the challenges that we're facing today. Th and that obviously is a huge challenge. Uh, there were two questions about terrorism and populism, and maybe there is uh, some connection between these two, two words and then two, two problems. Because, uh, uh, first of all, I think nobody can deny the fact that uh, uh, terrorism in Europe nowadays is uh, somehow is very 
uh, is in, in very close relations with, with, with the migration and an uncontrolled relation. And also there is another problem which is, must be solved in most of the European countries is a, is a social integration of, uh, how to say it uh, politically correctly, because it's also one of the problems, I think, of the European Union to speak stride, speak uh, and name the, the things what are they. Um, okay, uh, integration of some social groups and ethnic groups or maybe religion, religion, religion uh, religious uh, groups of uh, society. And um, that is also a, a, a link between the terrorism and not integration of some social groups and also populism. When you can create an enemy or you can name an enemy, you can uh, gain uh, votes. So it's a think it's a, that is the old recipe of that, or, or maybe that is the uh, politicians and everywhere use this uh, possibility to, to gain elections or, or to gain more uh, power. Okay, uh, what I wanted to say that um, uh, if, if we treat uh, the, the migration problem as it is, and we accept the fact that uh, overwhelming, uh, overwhelming majority of, the, of those persons who, who left their original country, they are not refugees, but they are migrants, economic migrants, who are seeking a better life. That is somehow it's, it's okay. But uh, the problem with the European Union, I think that uh, this question is not treated uh, outside of the borders of the European Union, but inside. And uh, therefore, we're facing a lot of uh, consequences, negative consequences. Uh, and as I told you, if, if there are problems within the European Union, for instance, uh, not integration of, of social or religious or other groups, that a problem with terrorism that is a, a good source for, for populism. Maybe these two things are very close to each other. Okay. Yeah. Um, Answer the question about why people are happy with, with the EU and also um, why does terrorism. I think the key word is every time the same. It's exclusion. People not feeling part of society anymore. Uh, if you look at terrorism nowadays, by the way, I'm a historian, terrorism affordably is not something new in Europe. I remember in the 70s, we had the Brigati Rossi in Italia, we had the Rota Me faction in Germany, we had the IRA in committing uh, attacks in, in Ireland, in the UK, we had the ETA in Spain, we had in the Netherlands a couple of attacks, uh, trains being, uh, being, people in trains being kidnapped. Um, but now I think, if you look at uh, who are the perpetrators of terrorist attacks, these are people who are fellow citizens, majority of them. Uh, people who have lived in the, in the EU for a long time, who have quite often been born in the EU. And why? Look at people from, well, from Morocco, from Afghanistan. Um, they cannot go back to their countries because they don't feel at home anymore. They have grown up in a different culture. They simply don't fit. At the same time, they don't feel at home in the EU, in the Netherlands. So they feel like second-class citizens. So that creates frustration. So basically, if you want to solve the problem of terrorism, is to not exclude them, but to include them. And that's, I think, the biggest challenge we have uh, right now. Um, if there is an attack in Berlin, in Paris, in Brussels, it's an attack on all of us. None of our countries will be able to defeat or face terrorism on its own. So we have to cooperate. There is no alternative. So we have to cooperate at political level, we have to cooperate at police level, even at, in at intelligence level, but it's, it's more difficult as Charles said, but there is no alternative on this issue. So again, you touched on the point with your question where <laughs> we have to work more together, not less together. So there is no, 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 no weight from this. And on the other hand, we have to reflect more at political, at sociological level 
uh, about what the ambassador just finished to say. Because most of those who perpetrated the, at least the last attacks, are European citizens. So why did this happen? Because some of the reasons the ambassador said, but there we have to be prepared to face these reasons and to find some solutions all together within the European Union. More questions? We have. Okay. Short questions, please. Then. Uh, ambassadors, oh, my name is João Otávio. <clears throat> I'm a law student at University of São Paulo. Uh, ambassadors, uh, with all this opposition to the EU in the home countries, uh, do you think that the politicians, the prime ministers and presidents of the EU might be impelled not to agree to a consensus on some sensible issues like intelligence sharing and migration because they feel pressed by their parties and by their peoples at home and might this impose some difficulties to the further integration of the EU. That's Hi, uh, my name is Isabella. Um, so with the recent immigration crisis in 2015, uh, many questions arise in various European Union countries, and the main questions being uh, with the country's identities and putting their political, uh, their political, economical, and social harmony at risk. And with Brexit and Le Pen showing a big number of supporters, uh, in my perspective, shows a huge uh, insatisfaction by the population. Um, and at the same time, the huge number of immigrants being those who are looking for asylum is necessary. So my question is, how can this instability and this gap between left and right, which, has, which seems to be a reoccurring theme, um, can be solved while still integrating both inside the EU and outside the EU? Um, hi, over here. Um, so my name is Anna, you, and you were talking about um, strong leaderships and that this is the time for strong leaderships. Um, I'm wondering how can we make leadership happen, uh, especially around youth, if we see a youth that is feeling actually insecure and cheated and betrayed by the governments, um, how would you say we can like bring that up to youth in general? Okay, <laughs> we will begin to answer. We can have one more question, please, one more, one more question. One more question. Hi, my name is Camila. Uh, last year we saw the Brexit. This year, in the beginning of this year, we avoided an exit, and now we are facing again a Frexit. Do you believe if any other countries decide to leave the UN, uh, the UA, do you believe in a future? Do you think it, it will end, or we will continue with the other remaining countries? Thank you. Okay, let's start. Uh, thank you. Um, 50 years ago, I worked in Washington, in DC. And uh, whenever you took a cab, the, the cab driver would be Somalian, Ethiopian, Pakistani. Um, and talking with them, um, I found that what they wanted to be is they wanted to be Americans. They wanted to be part of American society. They had their own personal, individual American dream. Now look at um, immigration in Europe. Uh, if you look at the election results in the Turkish election recently, uh, in the Netherlands, my fellow Turkish Dutch citizens, a much bigger part of them voted for Erdogan than in Turkey itself. Um, what does it mean? I think a lot of migrants in Europe came from more remote areas of Turkey, of Morocco. And uh, we see that that has, this makes it more difficult to, to integrate them. We have people in the Netherlands who have been living here in, in our country for 30 years and don't even speak Dutch. That would not happen in the United States. 
contrary to what some people may think, I think Europe needs migration. Our population is going down. Population is a big thrive of economic growth. So we need migrants. Today I read a report um, from uh, Dutch industry. We need to have knowledge workers simply to survive. So what does it mean? We have to look with another view to migration and try to be a little bit more uh, looking towards what migrants can bring to Europe. Like United States, people go there, but they want to be part of building American society. I think in the ideal uh, world, we would have migrants that are really wanting to contribute to our society. Of course, it's also our fault that we didn't do enough to integrate the people that are already there. So there's a huge task of making it really part of our society. Uh, and that's uh, why I think that we should change our view, our attitude towards migration, and, the, and that we should not uh, longer see it as a threat, because that will bring nothing but unrest and, and violence. We should see it as an opportunity. And really, we need more people in this world, in Europe. Thank you. Um, just a couple of points trying to build on the questions that were put forward. Um, I was talking, as far as leaderships are concerned, I was talking about um, the current leaderships uh, rising up to the occasion. Uh, we've, uh, those of you who are familiar with the European Union and uh, the history of the European integration, you'd see that there were uh, these great men that you, you, you know that they were essential, they were decisive at critical moments to, 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 to do the necessary drive of the European. They were essential at a particular juncture. Uh, today we need strong leaderships. It is a different European Union and particularly it is a different world. We are not talking about the same world. The world has transformed very, very fast in the last few years. And we all, I mean, I mean, in the world, be it the European Union or the, the other key players in the, in the world, we're all facing mostly the same problems. The populations, they are facing the same difficulties or the same challenges. We are not exactly dealing with different issues. It's the way we deal with them that changes. Uh, but be it so, your point is over general interests. We need different leaderships. We need stronger leaderships, particularly because the world has changed so, so much and to such a pace that perhaps our toolbox is no longer adequate to cope with this. I and mean, when we're talking about the uh, to, of digitalization, about the uh, structural um, loss of jobs, which is something we, today which is inevitable. Uh, we're talking about the challenges of, 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 you know, the uberization of the economy, as, as people have put it now. We need different solutions. Perhaps you need different people to come up with those solutions. So the, the question is a bit, well, it's really up to all of us, to all of you, this new generation, I mean, I, I hear all this nonsense sometimes about uh, the profile of the millennials and uh, their shortcomings and, and all of that. In fact, I mean, we need new leaderships and uh, we need to find new solutions. That, and I don't see, um, I don't see that coming uh, without a new breed, without a new, a new blood in a way, and that is really up to, to all of you. I, I think we need to re-engage. There's, um, there's a lot of indifference in a way to, to today. The fact that we have all these communication tools at our disposal, that we think that we are very, very, very connected, that you can know what is happening in Hong Kong and you are, in a way, uh, you, f you feel what is happening in, in Hong Kong as something that is also a part of you, but after three days, it's no longer a thing. It's like a match, you know? It's lightning and it's, uh, it's, it went off. So I, th I think that, in a way, although we are more connected because of globalization and more connected because of all the 
uh, the, e, the, the social media and all of that we have, we are not really more connected. And it says this is also a discrepancy that has created a lot of problems a bit between ourselves. Uh, one of the things that I was saying, or trying to say um, uh, before, was that we, are, we, we know a lot of what is happening today because of social media, even if it's not a very more than superficial approach of what is happening. But, you know, in a, in, a, in a second, you know what is happening on the other side of the world, that you feel like particularly touched by that, or uh, you, feel, you feel overwhelmed by that. But that does not um, rule out the fact that you still have a lot of old problems like I was saying, particularly in Europe, at our borders, old problems that have not been settled in a way. One of the problems today, in my view of the world, is that we have, we have new problems, new conflicts, and we have not been able to settle any one of the fundamental conflicts before. This is, this is, this is very difficult to, to, to manage. But again, you do, you do not plant leaderships. In a way, you could try to raise them, and uh, I think that's really up to um, liberal democracies today in our world to 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 find those leaderships. Uh, let's put the question straight: Which kind of migration we need? We need a migration of uh, uh, persons. I I, I just don't want to hurt anyway, of course. And, but uh, uh, the fact is that uh, the big number, or, or mostly, of the migrants nowadays are illiterate in Latin alphabet, and more of them are illiterate in their own language. Really, we need migrants when we have, for instance, big resources of migration or people, educated people, for instance, in, in Ukraine. But I think it's a very a uh, realistic question to answer that. When we also, or the European Union, is uh, condemning uh, Russia without, uh, you know, it's, uh, the question in Crimea and then Eastern Ukraine, the situation is, is like a war. And uh, all the Europe is uh, on the side of the Ukraine. Of course, uh, there's a recent fact that the uh, European Union uh, granted a visa-free uh, uh, entry for Europe, uh, Ukrainian uh, citizens uh, in the summer. It will uh, start in summer. Okay, but uh, if we admit a lot of persons without education, how we can uh, benefit from that? It's also a question because uh, in Europe we have a very high technology. We don't need any more uh, uh, workers who are working in, uh, excuse me for the, for the expression, but dirty jobs. Okay, and one more question, maybe it's uh, uh, answer to, to, to the young man's question, is uh, about uh, uh, exchange of, of sensitive and secure, secure and, and secret information between the secret services or another uh, authorities within the EU. The big problem is that the big number of, of, uh, of those who uh, want uh, to enter in Europe, they have no documents. They have lost their documents. And very difficult to ad identify those persons. And of course, uh, there is a big danger of, of, of infiltration of terrorist uh, elements or, 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 uh, or another unwanted persons to the European Union. And maybe that's the problem that, uh, of course, I, 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 I'm, I'm fully agree or I'm fully convinced that uh, on the member states level, there's a very uh, up-to-date exchange of information, but there are some uh, objective, objective uh, obstacles on that. If, if the person who is uh, seeking uh, asylum or, 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 or refugee in, in European Union has no document, how we can identify this person? I think it's a big challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think there was uh, a question at the, from the lady in the center about um, <coughs> Brexit. And um, frankly, I don't see Brexit as the, as the first step of, of other exits. Uh, 
Um, we had um, the election in the Netherlands, which went uh, in a way which uh, uh, the, the, the party which uh, was uh, supporting uh, some kind of uh, Euroscepticism didn't have the success which some feared it would have. Um, I don't think that in France in, um, on Sunday, um, because the majority of the French uh, will be voting in favor of the candidate who supports to remain in the European Union. This is a clear issue in the, in the campaign. Uh, let's see on Sunday, but it doesn't look like this will happen. Um, we have still uh, elections in Germany, it's true, but we, the main parties in Germany are, are pro-European, uh, so I don't see <laughs> any, 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 any problems arising from there. So um, this is a moment, it has been a difficult moment, obviously a moment of big uncertainties. But I think, I think Brexit will remain the exception. On the contrary, once we, we overcome this moment, we will have to again face uh, the question of all the countries who want to enter in the European Union. We have uh, negotiations, uh, some already begun, others have to begin, others there is a question mark and so on. So the, the question is completely different. If uh, we uh, are able to uh, be strong enough to overcome this moment, uh, Brexit will, in my opinion, remain an isolated uh, chapter, which is uh, a history all of its own. But that is another, uh, I think, uh, it, it worth a, it's worth a, a debate of itself, probably. Thank you. No other questions? We have more, more, more questions. Hi. Hi, my name is Fabio, here. Um, Brazilian, um, Portuguese, and Italian, and Spanish ancestors. Um, taking uh, Turkey as uh, just a reference, just a, a, a point of start of my question. Uh, Turkey has applied for uh, become a, f a full member of uh, European Union 20 years ago, 2-0. And now we are seeing what's happening in Turkey. Uh, first question, um, has the uh, European Union uh, become um, maybe bureaucratic, conservative, even old, sit back and relax it, and the things are coming to happen, uh, starting to happen now, and any regrets from your perspective? A lot of questions. Um, okay. Good evening, my name is Daniela. Um, bringing back the integration which all of you uh, brought up. When I see the uh, EU values, we see that they, um, they have worked when we think of economy or a territorial level about the no borders. But my question is uh, whether or not you think this could happen or this has happened on um, a cultural level or a idealistic level of thought. And maybe if this hasn't happened, if this could be the reason that these um, right wings and nationalist tendencies are coming back. Thank you. Thank you. We have... Uh, hi. Um, I'm Leandro. I would like to hear the opinion of the other uh, ambassadors or consuls regarding the Syri uh, Syria refugees question, because I totally understand the position of the, our angry colleague. Uh, but I believe the world feels like Europe is turning their backs on their situations. We see countries like Hungary, Austria, or Germany having to deal with this situation more directly. And I totally understand that Europe has the right to protect its borders from uncontrolled migration. But on the other hand, the situation is still there. And we still see pictures of uh, Syrian children dying on Mediterranean shores. And uh, in the last century, European countries migrated to a lot of different countries and regions of the world because of war as well. Like Brazil, for instance, I guess most part of us are directly descended from European families. My both parents are Portuguese and they ran away from Portugal in the 70s because of the Salazar. So how do you guys deal with that? I mean, I, I understand the dilemma, but there uh, must be a lot of pressure in the European community regarding that. Maybe I'm going to try to answer on the question of Turkey. Uh, as far as the, the EU enlargement is concerned, every uh, European country 
as a vocation to join the European Un Union soon. Uh, it is theoret theoretically feasible for Ukraine, Russia, uh, all, all countries uh, on the European continent. It's also the case of Turkey. Turkey, uh, Istanbul is in Europe, uh, geographically speaking. Uh, so, in fact, the EU rapprochement of uh, Turkey uh, dates from 1963. 1963, so quite a long time ago. Uh, simply, uh, it is when the AKP party uh, came to power in 2002 that a new impetus was given to the uh, EU rapprochement of Turkey. And uh, in 2002, AKP was the first party since the modern history of, uh, of Turkey uh, which was a religious party, a conservative one, but a democratic one in a Muslim country. So it, uh, it created quite a hope for reforms in Turkey, and we must admit that uh, Turkey made huge efforts at that time in 2002 and 2003 uh, to uh, tackle and to solve problems that were hindering uh, EU rapprochement. Uh, the Kurds, uh, the, the, con the con the civil control on army, etc., etc., and of course also the, the relig uh, religious freedoms. Uh, so the, the the progress was quite impressive, uh, and um, but we were not naive at that time. I, when uh, when this happened in 2002, 2003, I was I worked at the ministry uh, at uh, the Directorate Southeast uh, Europe. So I was I witnessed all those progress by Turkey. Uh, but we had no illusion, in fact, uh, as all candidate uh, countries, uh, Turkey has to implement the key communautaire, and it's not only just a legislation, but also foreign policies of the European Union. So it, uh, it also means the, means the, the, the Eastern uh, Partnership. Uh, at that time, in 2002-2003, uh, the European Union had developed policies for countries like Armenia. Uh, uh, Turkey uh, recognizes, uh, dip diplomatically recognized the existence of Armenia, but they don't have diplomatic relations. They didn't exchange ambassadors. We still have this problem of genocide. But the, the, the Turks do not agree about this word of genocide. But in, uh, in the EU rapprochement of Turkey, this is something they have to solve. Uh, Turkey uh, is also a candidate to become a EU member state. But there is one EU member state they don't recognize, it's Cyprus. Moreover, uh, uh, Turkey occupies a part of the, uh, you have Turkish troops on, uh, uh, on Cyprus territory. It's quite strange to be candidate uh, to a uh, European Union while you don't recognize the existence of one uh, of the, the, the member states. But there were uh, steps put forward to, um, to, uh, to have an implicit recognition that fin finally the Turkish uh, did not uh, make the, the expected moves, and that's where we are. In fact, uh, the, 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 the rapprochement process uh, is now stalled, and uh, it's not the fault of the European Union. I must say, uh, now with the last development since uh, the attempt of COP uh, last year, and, uh, and the police operation that have been performed since then, we are uh, worried formally uh, the, 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 the negotiation process, uh, the isolation process with Turkey is not interrupted, but it's almost stalled now. I, I thought we had agreed, Fernando, no difficult questions, but apparently... Um, just a couple of thoughts on this. I mean, I mean apart from what uh, Charles has already, Charles has already uh, said about Turkey, I think... Those values are over there. We have the Aki, we have uh, um, uh, a certain amount of rules that we have to abide by. It's fundamentally a political process. And although um, the enlargement process to Turkey has an underlying geopolitical theme uh, in it, obviously, because Turkey is no ordinary country. It is a, a key country in, in its uh, geographical position. Obviously, it makes the dis negotiation process with the European Union all the more important. Um, but it's all about values. Uh, negotiating an enlargement has to do with 
the values of the European Union, whether or not you are able and willing to accept those values. And this is actually a lesson for everything else when you're talking about the future of the European Union. So I think the last few developments were not encouraging, to say the least. And uh, again, like uh, Charles was saying, uh, this, uh, we, we hope that this does not compromise the, the principle of the negotiation. Uh, I, I'm comfortable with it because uh, Portugal has already, has always been uh, uh, in favor of, 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 of uh, accepting Turkey in, uh, according to the conditions, obviously. As far as uh, the, our southern, southern problems are concerned and the, the issue of migration, um, I mean, it, it, it's, if you put it in abstract, it's quite easy. You say, those are human beings fleeing conflict. Uh, the European Union needs to keep an open door for them. It's a matter of uh, solidarity, humanism. That's all part of our DNA as, as, as a bloc, as, a, as, a, as a, a set of values. That's all very well. And then you have the issues of economic migration that have been also mentioned here by our, our, our Hungarian colleague. And those, you also have to cope with them because it's in every country's uh, remit uh, and sovereignty to decide how to deal with those, okay? But the problem is still there. It, obviously, we have internalized this, these two different uh, uh, objectives within the decision-making process of the European Union, which is very, very complex. This has created, obviously, differences of opinion and tension. But it's, it's the only way we have to deal with this. And uh, I, I agree with has, what has been said here, particularly by the uh, Ambassador of the Netherlands, that migration it is fundamental for the European Union. We have a demographic problem, in case you haven't noticed, a huge demographic problem. We need, uh, uh, we need not only qualified, not only qualified, uh, economic migration. We need economic migration in some sectors. It depends on what country are we, we're talking about. It depends. So uh, I think we are trying to craft, it's difficult, we're trying to craft uh, that this very complex decision making model we have, trying to, 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 to strike the right balance between these two priorities. It is easy to picture them in abstract. It's very difficult to come forward with, with the right sort of balance. But we, slowly, we are getting there. We are getting there. I, I would also like to make a reference to um, something, some, someone mentioned this uh, a while ago, which is, I think it's, it has to do with the, the, the values, whether or not these, um, these nationalisms and, and all have to do with the fact that we have been drifting away of these values. I think that is the case. I think we have to, just, just a, a, a bracket to say that we have, not all the European Union countries uh, are uh, in a way uh, drifting away from the European Union uh, uh, values or that they are drifting away from uh, accepting the European Union where there, it, is, it is not the case for every European Union country. Depends. Um, and, but I think that, uh, if uh, we wanted to resume, uh, to do the resumo da opera, like you'd say here, as far as this is concerned, is that it's all about the values. It's all about the values. Uh, uh, it's striking the right balance between these values. And if we have, in a way, directly or indirectly allowed for too much room for these nationalist uh, drive or advances, maybe it's because we are drifting away from those values. Because in a way, the core values of the European Union, they're there exactly for us to come up with the right balances and the right solutions. Okay. Um, uh, about um, uh, discrepancy between the migration in, in nowadays and, and uh, after World War II, um, uh, that's a very big difference. For instance, uh, my Hungarian fellow, they can uh, uh, support me in that, uh, stating that, that at that time, 
uh, the migrants from Hungary for, for European countries, for other countries, were invited by the Brazilian government to come here. And the, 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 the migrants, let's say that, they were uh, sending their, uh, or the migrant nation, uh, migration organization, they sent their personal data to several uh, governments and, and countries, and those countries who accepted them, then they uh, traveled to that country. And uh, it, it means that it was controlled migration. That is the big, big difference between the situation nowadays and, and uh, after the Second World War, World, World War II. And also, uh, I agree that solidarity is one of the one of the value of the European Union. And also, I don't know if if it's written there or not. Uh, the Christianity, uh, the Christianism also is characterized by the solidarity. I, I agree with that. But uh, also, we have to consider uh, the problems of integration of of non-Christian communities in the European Union. In some countries. In the European continent, this is a very big question and then the big uh, problem. And uh, it was said that, uh, like uh, the United States, uh, Europe uh, nowadays also needs uh, migration, of course. Uh, I visited Ellis Island in, in, in uh, New York and uh, I was shocked when I read one of the questions which was put uh, to the migrants. It reflects well what was the the level of 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 of, uh, of, uh, of education or 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 uh, or, or uh, average knowledge of, of those migrants. A question was that: uh, How do you wash up the star staircase from below to upstairs, or from upstairs to downstairs? Okay, and it was in the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century, and now we are in the 21st century. That was, I, I can say that the United States has more than 100 years to, to achieve the today's situation. I think European Union has no time for that. We have no 100 years when the, the world is changing suddenly and, and very, very fast way. When we have China, when we have another emerging regions and countries, I don't know, we need qualified migrants, that's my opinion. Of course, uh, some countries are uh, have different approach on that, I admit that. Uh, but another question that I, I already put it, uh, that uh, we have uh, neighboring countries which can be uh, much more easily integrated into the European Union than uh, those citizens uh, which have very different cultural, religious, and so on so forth uh, background. Okay, and I think uh, this is also a question which can be or must be answered. Thank you. One, one more answer. So, um, referring to migration, which is as Paulo said, difficult question <laughs> we, we thought wouldn't come up, but obviously it, it came up. It's, it's a, it was part, let's say, of, the, of, of, of one of the points which were indicated. Um, what a uh, Hungarian colleague said is, is I, I agree that the comparison to what happened in Brazil uh, to nowadays is quite different, uh, especially the Italians came here to substitutes the slaves. Um, we, we, we don't want nothing like that in Europe because there is a risk that many of those migrants be exploited on the black market. That is something we have to avoid. So um, the point is to strike the right balance of how many migrants we, uh, I'm, I'm talking of economic migrants, obviously, because we have to keep it very much uh, distinguished from the, from the refugees, from those who need protection, which is another issue. But the economic migrants, we have to find this, the right balance, because what uh, uh, the Dutch ambassador said is obviously true. I mean, we have a declining uh, population and in Europe, so we need a certain amount of migrants. We need to control, to, need to understand how many of them 
we can absorb, okay? Because uh, opposite to Brazil, Europe is not empty. Brazil was empty at the times we had uh, the big migrations and there was a dear need of have a workforce to, uh, uh, to come to Brazil and to literally build the country. So what, uh, while we discuss this, and this is obviously one of the points, <laughs> one of the difficult points we have to discuss in Europe, because we have to face the problem altogether, even if every country then has to make is its uh, choices and how, how, how many migrants it can absorb. But while we discuss this, um, I would like to remember that what we are doing now is saving thousands of migrants every day. We are not closing our southern border. We have uh, military ships of not only of Italy, but from many other uh, European countries who are helping out. And we are going to save every day thousands and thousands of those migrants. So while, while we discuss this, I don't like the idea that the European Union, what, what sometimes appears, is, is, is just closing. It's quite, it's quite, the, the, quite the opposite, it's true. But one point is, while we go on with this discussion on how we can manage better a migration policy to, to Europe, I mean, we cannot lose uh, the, the point, which is the cause. Why are those people migrating? I mean, the economic migrants. I'm not referring to those who are fleeing from war zones or from dictatorships. The economic migrants. So what I will say is very obvious, but if we don't work together, and Europe has to work together in this, is to create better conditions in the country of origin of the migrants. It's obvious. You will say, ah, this is in the long term. Okay, but we have to work to, uh, for, uh, uh, for this, even if it's a long term objective. Not because it's a difficult objective, we don't have to work, and only if we really are able to have a better cooperation with many countries of Northern Africa, of the Sahel, of, um, of the Equatorial Africa, where the majority of our economic migrants come from, we, we will be able to uh, tackle the long-term solution to a right balance of the migration from the south to the north. It's difficult, sure, it's difficult. And I'm not just saying, it's, it's obvious what I'm saying, and it's been, discussing, been discussed for a long time. This doesn't uh, 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 leave a part that we have to try to realize something more concrete and more uh, uh, tangible in terms of creating better life conditions and cooperating better with those countries. It's like I would ask you, um, how do you solve the problem of criminality in Brazil? Is it just with uh, reinforcing the police, having more police in the streets, more police in the, in the, in the um, favelas and so on? I think we all agree that it's not just a problem of having a more public order, but you have also to have social policies uh, in place and cultural policies and inclusion and to fight inequality. So these are enormous tasks. But it's not because these are enormous tasks that you will uh, not try to tackle them. Okay. Uh, this uh, point? Hi, my name is Eduardo. Uh, uh, my question is, when it comes to the uh, groups and parties that go more extreme than merely uh, Eurosceptic, so groups like um, the Sons of Odin or uh, the Golden Dawn Party. Uh, what is the European Union, uh, European Union's role in containing um, such movements, and what is the national government's role in containing such movements? Another question. Um, hi, over here. My name is Peter. I go. I study here at Innsbruck and. When we look back a little bit more than 100 years, like in 1913, we saw that the world GDP, 47% uh, of it come, came from Europe. And when we look uh, 100 years after that, so in 20, 2012, we see that only 25% of the world's GDP came from Europe. 
And when you say, uh, sometimes you say that we need new blood and new people to make changes, but sometimes we, we feel that the opportunity for those new people are not, are, not giving the, are not being given the right way. So how do you see Europe in the next years and the, the challenges that, that things are, are bringing, the way, the way things are going? Hi. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Tomas, and my question is about migration as well, but from the cultural perspective. Uh, is your population ready to, to this cultural shock from immigrants, and how do you prepare your population for, the, for this? It was said that immigrants are necessary for rising population, but is your population inside your country ready for this cultural shock? Have another question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Denise, and first of all, I would like to say sorry to you, Mr. Mikel, and your children for that hour and a half you spent there in Argentina trying to enter the country. And I would like to have your opinion in terms of competencies, I mean, in terms of HR, human resources competencies you think nowadays are needed yeah, within the, the European labor market. And if this Brexit, uh, Brexit thing is, is modifying, is changing this. Um, hello, my name is Diego, and uh, my question is that now that given that Brexit is a thing, what are the expectations of the European Union regarding the United Kingdom, given that um, Scotland have a prime minister that looks to like maybe break away from the, the United Kingdom to, to stay in the European Union? I've seen some news regarding that. I know that a few years ago there was a referendum uh, regarding the possible separation of Scotland and uh, I want to know what are the expectations for this and if Scotland breaks out from the United Kingdom, if the European Union will receive them or not, given that they were together with England in the Brexit. Thank you. Let's answer, please. As far as migration is concerned, I was uh, one of the panelists last year here at the uh, INSPIRE faculty to speak about about this issue, and uh, I, would, I don't want to, 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 to remake this debate, but uh, personally, I don't believe in a zero immigration. It's not possible. If you look at the uh, European history, uh, uh, we constantly had flows of immigrants, and that's why you have one third of uh, the Europeans who speak a Latin language, another third who speak Germanic languages or Slavic languages. Uh, the reality is that uh, the continent, the European continent, has no uh, natural border and uh, the flow of migrants makes part of our history. And this is something we have to take it, uh, for, for, for granted. As far as Belgium is concerned, uh, we have had uh, different waves of immigrants in our history too. Uh, Polish at the end of the, the, 20th, uh, the, 20th, uh, the 19th century, they, were, uh, they come uh, to our country to work in our coal mines. We had Italian immigrants after the Second World War uh, were clearly uh, economic immigrants. Uh, we also had an active uh, uh, migration, uh, economic migration policy in the 17th when we had food, full employment. Uh, we needed uh, workers from Morocco and Turkey. Uh, and then we closed the tap. Uh, it does not mean that nowadays we don't have a migration anymore. Why? The first source of migration is simply uh, uh, the family reunification. Once uh, some, this is also uh, linked to uh, the European legislation. Once uh, a foreigner legally lives uh, on uh, the territory of a member state, he is entitled to uh, let uh, his wife and his children come. And this is the main source of immigration today in, Bra uh, in uh, Belgium. We are attached to the uh, right of asylum. Uh, we signed the Geneva Convention. Uh, we were one of the first uh, countries that ratified this convention. In fact, we did not start to uh, welcome uh, 
exile is uh, just because this convention existed. We uh, already welcomed uh, famous uh, exiles uh, uh, in the 19th century. Some of uh, you have maybe heard about a uh, uh, manifest of a communist party uh, signed by Karl Marx in uh, 1848. Well, this document was published in Brussels. Uh, Karl Marx was a political refugee in Belgium and he had the right to publish things. Our regime was extremely liberal. Another famous uh, political refugee was Victor Hugo, uh, the, the, the French writer who uh, wrote in Belgium and published in Belgium uh, uh, an extremely violent pamphlet against uh, the Emperor Napoleon III. So we have this tradition, we continue to have this tradition, and it is on behalf of this tradition that in 1956 we also welcomed uh, Hungarian refugees who were fleeing uh, 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 the, the troops of the Warsaw Pact. Uh, just to say that migration continues. The key word is integration. And I must say, uh, this is a learning process. Uh, we, uh, we continue to uh, develop our integration policies. And it is true that sometimes with migrants, we have more problems with the third generation than with the first. Uh, that's with what we could observe with the terrorists also. In fact, those terrorists are, are people with uh, uh, good uh, criminal records. Uh, they were smoking, they were drinking, nothing to see with uh, Muslim. Don't, don't, don't so easily establish a link between uh, Islam and terrorism because this is not our experience. Um, about Brexit, uh, in fact, we are uh, in a totally new matter. The, 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 the treaty, uh, Article 50 of uh, the Treaty of Lisbon stipulates that the member states can go out of the European Union. Uh, the, there is a procedure in two years, but in fact, we do not know what is going to happen. To happen, uh, uh, the leaders of uh, the head of state and of government uh, met in uh, Brussels two or three days ago uh, just to adopt the negotiation guidelines. The 27 uh, member states, uh, uh, the negotiation, the, the 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 Brexit negotiation hasn't started yet because now we have elections in the UK and we are losing time. Uh, in fact, uh, the European Union uh, identified uh, three uh, important issues. The right of uh, the EU citizens on uh, the UK after the Brexit and symmetrically uh, also the rights of uh, UK citizens uh, who will stay uh, on the territory of the European uh, Union after the, the formal Brexit. The second issue is uh, budget. Uh, in fact, uh, we, the, the 27 uh, remaining uh, member states, we are of the opinion that uh, the, 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 the budget which had been adopted uh, in 2014 uh, with the consent of UK needs to be implemented. And so it means that uh, despite the, the Brexit, UK will have to, to respect uh, its, uh, its commitment. And the third uh, important thing is Ireland, but I'm not a specialist on this issue, but uh, we have the Good Friday Agreement that gives some rights to people uh, of uh, Northern and uh, the, the, the Irish Republic, and uh, it's certainly not uh, the idea, according to this uh, agreement, to uh, create a new border between uh, the two Irish people. Thank you. I'm Totally, uh, totally support what Charlie said about uh, about migration. Just wanted to, to, uh, to, to, to uh, offer another offer another thought, which is that uh, today we live in a state of uh, permanent migration. I'm, I'm, my country is a country who has always, always from from the start been a migration country, and uh, we still are. Um, I don't think that there is a Portuguese today who doesn't have a relative or a friend who is not, has not migrated to a different country, uh, be it uh, less or more qualified sort of migrant. And I think that all of you probably have uh, your own relatives or friends who have tried uh, other opportunities, uh, first as students and then later on as uh, professionals, uh, tried to have some sort of professional alternatives. Uh, in, in other countries. It's the way of the world today. It's part of globalization as well. 
and uh, even European Union countries who are here today have uh, painfully found out in the last five or six years when we were hit um, by the international financial crisis that many of our young brains, as they put it, had to find alternatives elsewhere. This happened a lot, even to, uh, to, to countries we, which you are not used to see this happening uh, with. So I think the issue of migration, I, 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 I know, I, I'm sure that we need to separate asylum issues and uh, refugees from migration, um, but uh, I think that migration is an inevitable um, it's an inevitable uh, characteristic of today's world that you, we, we need to, to, to face and we need to integrate it in our own migration policies. The problem in, in the southern borders particularly is that uh, although, as long, uh, although these people if, which are fleeing, we are fleeing, enter the European Union, although they enter and they become a European Union uh, uh, challenge, it's still the, 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 the member states who are going to deal them on their own national migration policy. So the, difficult, the difficulty here is to, 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 to find the right blend of policies and uh, to, to come up with a, a common uh, migration policy. That, that is ultimately the, the, the greatest challenge. I also wanted to refer to a question put, I think, by Vitor. Um, if I, if I got it right, uh, you mentioned the fact that in the last 20 years you see the, um, the GDP of the European Union decreasing, uh, which is a fact, obviously it is a fact. And I think that's the, the reason why I wanted to, 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 to take up your question is because I think that is a fundamental question as well. I think ac actually we, we discussed this last year here as well in one of the panels. I think, Jan, I stand corrected if that is the case. Um, do you we have that challenge. Uh, one of the things about the, the, the about Europe is that you have this, you know, very respectable social model, this very respectable social construction. That even when you are in crisis, like the one that hit us uh, four or five years ago, you still have this network, this essential network that provides minimum uh, elementary protection to, to, to people. And, and this is something that I think Europe has to be proud about. It changes from country to country, but I think on and all, it is something that every, uh, every country in the world understands and, and respects. And is actually one of the, the reasons why um, this uh, integration model has been exported. I mean, the model of European Union integration has been has become also a model to be duplicated by other uh, regions in the world. Uh, but the fact remains that we are losing pace. The fact remains that the European Union has lo lost competit competitiveness. That is a fact. And uh, I think that that is one of the challenges we have because you need to create wealth. And the, the way you create wealth today is totally different. Like I was saying a, a while ago, there's this a different form of, 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 of the economy that we have to deal with. You have this uberization. You, you have these new, these, uh, uh, you have Industry 4.0, uh, a different, uh, uh, different sort of economy that you need to cope with. And I think that the European Union is, at commission level, not, not only that, is slowly becoming aware of this and setting the right policies, the right blend of policies, to, to make the European Union more competitive without losing, again, what also makes it, what makes it its distinguished characteristic, which is this model of social network. But I think that you've touched a point which is fundamental today, that in a way, uh, a, a part of this resistance, a part of this nationalist drive, a part of this discomfort, social discomfort, this sense of, 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 of loss and, and, and exclusion you find in the European Union today has to do with the fact that our model, <coughs> our economy, has not been able to respond properly to the new challenges of the, of the international economy. Um, because we are 28, because um, we have not been able to, to adapt 
as, as fast as we would like to. But I think that the European Union, with some of the programs, particularly in digital economy, not, not, not only so, incentives to industrialization, <coughs> is slowly coming to grip. So I think but your question is, is, is a very important question today. And I think it's, it's in the, the heart of the problems that we live today. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the Brexit, I would like to assure you that there will be no hooks it. I think it's, I can say that Hungary will not leave the European Union. Uh, it's <coughs> maybe the, the unique question or the only question in the, Euro in the Hungarian inner, pol in, uh, inner politics that uh, uh, even uh, the opposite or all, all opposite forces are uh, pro-Europeans. And the 70% of the Hungarian population is supporting. Hungarian membership in the EU. We don't want to exit the European Union, we want to reform it, to, to, to transform it. That is a big, big difference. Um, speaking about, uh, talking about the Brexit, uh, Hungary's position is that uh, uh, the UK is it's a very important global player. We, we, we have to maintain close to the European Union after the Brexit because in many uh, aspects, uh, it, it's a big, 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 uh, big country, and, and the, the full member of or, or permanent member of the United Nations, and and uh, also member of the NATO, and and we, we need United Kingdom near the European Union, and uh, if if the Brexit will take place, who knows? But yeah probably, but uh, we have to also have a very bold and very comprehensive uh, uh, free trade agreement with, with the United uh, Kingdom. And also, I think it affect, uh, affects all our uh, European uh, countries, uh, which has a more or less uh, numerous uh, community in the United K Kingdom. Uh, as far as Hungary, we have officially 55,000 Hungarians living uh, in the United K Kingdom, but uh, the number, real number is about 200,000 Hungarians living, living in the United Kingdom. And that's why it's very important that uh, those persons, not only Hungarian origins, but all other uh, European citizens, they have, will, will have uh, the same rights that they have now in, in the as a as in the member country of the United uh, in the European Union, um, th there were a question about uh, a cultural shock or or or, or, or this problem. Uh, yes, I, I, I was posted in Kazakhstan a few years ago, and uh, what I noticed what what a, a tendency that uh, there were I. I, I Talking about the interior, not not, not in the big uh, cities, but uh, in the provinces, in, in interior, in Portuguese. Uh, the only uh, new buildings or new constructions were the what to say, mis miskis, mosquitoes, mis mosquitoes of this school, mosque, yes. Uh, and the influence of the of the inf uh, Islam and the widespreading of Islam is was very, very. Uh, Shocking for me. Okay, I have seen more and more young women uh, wearing hijab, and also because oh, what what was behind that? Because uh, uh, that was a very uh, public information on that, and not not like a secret information. Hijab, and also because oh, what what was behind that? Because uh, uh, that was a very. Uh, Public information on that, and not not like a secret information, but the uh, the Gulf countries uh, gave a lot of uh, grants to uh, to Central uh, Asian countries, and uh, the influence of, of those countries was very notable in in, in Kazakhstan and other countries in the Central Asia. What I I wanted to say that uh, if we are facing this tendency, uh, maybe there is not very opportune to to invite more and more. Uh, Muslim people to, 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 to Europe. Maybe there are some danger of that. Of course, it's not, maybe sounds not very politically correct. But uh, what are behind the facts? That the integration is, is a very, very tough question. And some countries failed in, in, in integration of, of these, these groups. And uh, we, we should also take into account uh, uh, the problem with the demographic, demographic uh, uh, figures or statistics on. on on that, that uh, 
the, the growing number of number of of, of, uh, of those uh, another religious persons are growing in, in Europe and uh, of course the problem is is in Europe that we we are uh, less and less uh, but uh, there is a big question about about who will uh, what what will be the old uh, European uh, values like like Christianity in these days. Um, I want to answer the question that was uh, raised about uh, how to contain extremist uh, groups, movements. Um, as I said before, I think diversity is the strong point of Europe, so we should be very careful to exclude groups. For me, it's fairly simple. We have constitutions, we have the European Court of Human Rights, we've got our laws, and everything that's been done within the framework of these laws is permittable, it's good. Um, and it's up to the courts to say whether people or not have violated the law. And clearly, when people violate the law, there have to be consequences. Uh, but I would not be in favor of restricting the freedom of, of expression. I think uh, the most important thing to do is to try to take away the root causes of the frustration of these people. And then I come back to what I said before, that's trying to increase the sense of belonging, making them feel part of society. And I think then we'll have less extremism than we have nowadays. The last but not least. No, I, I think there was a question for me, but I, 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 I forgot to take note, so I'm um, so sorry, can, what, what was... Uh, can, you, can you repeat the, the, the point quickly? Which other competencies or, or skills you think are needed nowadays within these changes, changing market? In you mean, opinion, uh, I mean what what we need in Co Europe? Competencies, skills, yeah. Uh, probably that's, that's what was uh, like raised by by the ambassador before. I mean, uh, uh, we uh, have uh, are faced in some of our countries with with uh, with the problem, on the one hand, of some of our brains, which uh, find uh, better solutions abroad. We have a lot of uh, researchers who maybe find better opportunities in the US or even in some other European countries. And on the other hand, it's true that we need also to uh, look at our own labor market to, to see what kind of competences are, are needed now. But this would be part of uh, this reflection on a balanced migration policy. Okay, so this is one, it's, it's an issue you cannot answer simply like that and say, okay, we need this, this and that. It's something more, more complicated, more articulated probably uh, uh, from, from that point of view. But uh, also taking into account how labor market is evolving nowadays in Europe. No, we, we also in the industry, the, the, the pure labor is, is, is declining looking at, at, at the intellectual labor. It's not like in, in the old days where you needed the, the workers in the, in the first hand. So I, th I would say it's, it's a more, um, more uh, articulated uh, uh, policy issue, which I see difficulty in, in debating at central level, at European level nowadays. Probably each country has to make uh, its, uh, its, its, its choices. And then we have to articulate and coordinate. Because again, this migration um, issue, we solve it together. We can face it together, okay? Because people are entering Italy because it is the closest point to enter Europe. They not all want necessarily to stay in Italy, as we all know, so it is not just uh, our a uh, problem to to face. We, our problem together is to save the lives. But then how we tackle this wave of migration which is growing, the numbers are growing, is again something we have to reflect all together and especially look at the long-term solution as I, as I mentioned before.
Well, bad news and good news. Bad news that we have to finish the debate. It was amazing. Thank you very much to come. It was an honor to inspire to, to have you here. Good news that you have a very good coffee break here to continue debating this issue. So thank you very much. You too. Thank you.